The hospitalier and her minions were waiting for us in the docking bay, along with a disconcertingly high number of tech priests. Thinking fast, if not hard, Tink jammed the techno-heretical drone up the front of his shirt, which made him look pregnant and caused a fair bit of amusement among the orderlies. None of the cogboys seemed to notice, and after they'd taken possession of the Majos's head, for data extraction they'd said, all of them left without incident. Sarge tried to follow them, but only got a few meters before the hospitalier neatly tripped him onto a gurney. The incredibly fluffy pillow defeated any further attempts to refuse treatment. While the burns Amy had received when her long lays exploded got the most attention, all of us wound up getting hauled to the med bay by Doc's Valkyrian girlfriend. Well, except for Jim, who tagged along with the other tech priests to keep an eye on his... Sample? Trophy? rescue Whatever you called the head your metaskull had sawed off the still warm body of its patient. Seriously, that right there is why no one trusts those things. Anyway. Everyone except Sarge was stuck in the med bay for a while. Despite their size, those sniper beams had been just as nasty as any Lay's guns and it was surprising how many holes we had in us. Sarge was set loose after a basic patch job and yet another stimulant. Thankfully, not a combat one this time. To go talk with the adepts and other interrogators. Doc made him promise to come back for a complete round of treatment the second the situation was resolved. Speaking of Doc, he was rather happy to see us all again. Nubby filled him in on the basics of what had happened, with Twitch and Fumbles correcting the occasional exaggeration. Doc was as surprised as the rest of us had been when we got to the part about running into Amy and the Majos. He wheeled over to where she was being treated by the hospitalier just to verify we weren't bullshitting him. In his semi-professional medical opinion, she was in for a rough few days as they speed grew the skin on her face and arms. But she should recover without much scarring or needing any augmetics. He claimed his girlfriend had a lot of experience treating burns. Something about working with trainee dominions. While the rest of us chatted with Doc, Tink had pulled the screen around his bed and loudly threatened to shoot anyone who looked inside. Occasionally, the nurses would look up at the loud clanging noises and the do not disturb sign, and then start giggling. When the humor of the situation wore off and the noise was starting to get really annoying, we steeled our nerves and went to see just what he was doing in there. We found Tink with the drone between his legs, but thankfully his pants were on. He was trying to pop out an impressive dent in the front of Spot's chassis. When asked how it had happened, he reminded us of the enemy psyker he'd taken out. It had used some sort of shield to deflect his plasma bolt, and looked like it was about to launch its own attack. So he'd had Spot ram the bastard. It's hard to cast spells when 50 kilos of angry drone is bashing your head in. Turns out the psyker had one hell of a helmet, though. Hence the dent. Still, it had convinced the warpy bastard that it was time to fall back, so he was calling it a win. Doc, who'd been eyeing the large lens next to the dent, cut into the story at this point and asked if that meant he had a clear picture of the attackers. Tink shrugged and admitted that he probably did. But so did the adepts who'd been watching the feed. They'd get around to telling us who it was eventually, and he was the only one who could fix this dent so his priorities were clear. The rest of us were a little more curious, so Nubby yanked the spanner out of Tink's hands and refused to give it back until he pulled up the vid of the ramming. After a little fast-forwarding, he found it, and everyone crowded around the data slate. We retreated to a view of a small room with a blurry figure standing in the middle of it and gesturing. As we watched, the blur was replaced by a large circular shield, and the screen went blindingly bright. When the flash faded, there was a tall, robed figure, 
with a sword and egg-shaped helmet standing there panting. He raised his sword, gathered some sort of lightning around it, and then the drone hit him in the back of his stupid hat. Other inquisitorial agents might have sat there and carefully examined the psyker's robes or weapons for clues. We just kept having Tink rewind so we could see the headbutt again. When he got the sound turned on, it made this great sort of hollow clang every time the drone hit him. There was much debate over which was the best part. The initial impact or the part where his head went through the drywall and got stuck. Either way, it was the best show we'd seen in a long time. We wound up putting the vid on repeat on all the screens in the med bay. It was very therapeutic to see the bastard flailing his fancy sword around in an attempt to fend off the drone and cut his head free at the same time. At Twitch's urging, Tink even etched a little egg-helmeted face on the side of Spot's chassis to commemorate the event. Everyone was in remarkably good spirits considering we were stuck in the med bay for the foreseeable future. Well, except for Amy, who was still tranked up for the worst part of her burn treatment. Fumbles tried to send her a mental image of the whole thing as she slept, but Doc made him stop after a nearby diagnostic cogitator caught fire. While the rest of us were laughing ourselves sick over the Inquisition's funniest home videos, Sarge was attending a very serious meeting with some very serious people. You could tell they were serious because none of them even smiled when the adepts played the drone ramming clip for them. They just muttered to each other about which craft world the Eldar Warlock had come from, and what possible hand they could have in everything. Sarge primarily contributed to this discussion by resting his head on the table and agreeing with anything our team's adepts said. In Sarge's opinion, the other two interrogators were putting way too much effort into trying to understand the Eldar's motives. They'd gone through the vids from Tink's drone and Jim's skulls frame by frame, and determined that there'd been a warlock, three rangers, and some sort of heavy weapon team operating a bright lance. There was a little debate on the last point, since all of Jim's drones had been shot before they could get a good picture. Neither of the other teams had run into any hostiles, and they hadn't spotted anything when they'd done a flyby off the island. So it looked like that was it for their ground assets. Sword Guy half-heartedly suggested that the Eldar could be behind the disappearances. They were Xenos, with access to warpy powers and archaeotech after all. He didn't press the issue when Sarge grumpily asked why they hadn't used their creepy silhouette-leaving people disappearer instead of shooting us with fancy laser guns. Battleaxe claimed that the small size of their force suggested they were an assassination team. Given their attack patterns, location, and the fact that no one else of importance was nearby, their target must have been the Majos. From his spot at the end of the table, Sarge grumbled that he'd told everyone the Xenos had been trying to kill the Tech Priest an hour ago. Battleaxe ignored him and pointed out that the real question was whether this was connected to the disappearances, and if it was because the Majos had known something. Rather annoyed at being ignored, Sarge sarcastically suggested that they ask the Majos that question. To his considerable surprise, everyone took this seriously, with Sword Guy even asking his psyker if he was capable of leading a seance. The debate over whether the ritual was more likely to result in useful information or a demon infestation was still raging when the tech priests arrived. Just saying they arrived doesn't do it justice. Every single cogboy over the rank of engine seer on the occurrence border walked, rolled, floated, or slithered into the meeting room. The ratio of metal to meat in there hit 50-50 in the first few seconds, and climbing towards 80-20 when Jim brought up the rear of the procession. Sarge took notice of how nervous the younger cogboy looked, as, at an order from a senior tech priest, he sealed the door behind him. 
It occurred to the burly noncom that if a bunch of guardsmen had done something like this, it would have been because some officer was about to become a friendly fire statistic. Sarge edged his chair away from the table and towards the most defensible corner he could find, and casually put one hand in his pocket. No one except Jim paid him any attention. The engine seer leaned out from behind his superiors, and awkwardly tried to indicate that this was not the time to pull out a grenade, or possibly that his neck hurt and he wanted to lie down for a while. Jim was bad at guard hand signals. After a bit of unpleasant silence, the cogiest of the cog boys finally decided that the tension had built to acceptable levels. In a loud, authoritative, and entirely synthetic voice, he proclaimed that a seance would not be necessary. They had extracted all relevant data from the Majos' eidetic memory chip. He just sort of stopped there with no explanation of what the data actually was, leaving the non-metallic portion of the room awkwardly waiting. The second battle axe began to ask, the head tech priest cut her off with a shout of, That information is sacred. It contains Mechanicus secrets. Sharing it with those who do not venerate the Omnissiah in his true form would be heretical. The cogboys behind him echoed the words sacred, secrets, and heretical like shitty backup singers. Sarge let out a weary sigh and rubbed his aching temples. It was going to be a long meeting. When Sarge finally staggered back into the med bay, he looked bloody exhausted. He pretty much collapsed in the first available bed, and at his request, we stopped the continuous loop of the warlock getting his head stuck in the wall. Doc gave him some overdue medical treatment, and he filled us in on the situation. To start with, he gave us the official word that we'd been shot full of holes by an Eldar hit squad. Nubby fist bumped and loudly started calculating what his and Fumble's share of the pool was. Sarge immediately crushed this happy speculation with the news that the Eldar were not the cause of the attacks, and had only been there for the Majos, unless Amy could tell us otherwise. No one would be collecting on the pool anytime soon, and unless there was a second group of Eldar, Nubby's odds weren't looking good. While Nubby whined to himself, the discussion shifted to the Majos, his decapitation, and the tech priests. According to Sarge, all of them, even Jim, had a gear up their ass about something they'd gotten out of the Majos' head. It had been like pulling teeth to get anything out of them. They kept falling back on the whole, we technically only have to answer to the Inquisitor, so get an order from him, argument. In the end, all they were willing to part with was that the Majos had been chasing a piece of Archaeotech and had tracked it into the Xeno territory. He'd intercepted some reports that confirmed the nature of the Archaeotech and the heresies the Xenos had committed on it. He'd sent a report to the proper authorities and was still tracking the Archaeotech when he was killed by the vile Eldar. Finally, the nature of the tech was not for us to know. But it would not cause the sort of disappearances we'd seen. We should turn our investigations elsewhere. The priests had refused to say anything more. The proper authorities had been notified, and the matter should be left to them. Further probing into the Mechanicus's holy secrets would be unwise. It had taken a heroic effort by the other two interrogators and our old diplomat adept to convince the tech priests that their warning was understood. The entire army of cogboys had left secure in the knowledge that no one would be poking into their business, and that everyone would be focusing on the completely unconnected matter of the disappearances. The second they were gone, one of the psychers had done something that made the room sound all weird, and the diplomat had asked for a show of hands. 
Who here, he had asked, thinks we're looking for a piece of insanely dangerous archaeotech that's either wiping all intelligent life off worlds or is being pursued by someone who is willing to do so to keep it secret. The eyes had it by a landslide. Sarge said it was nice to be reminded that not everyone in the Inquisition was stupid or insane. In the end, the working theory was that someone was hauling this thing from Tau space to the Imperium via warp ship. Whether it was to sell, study, warship, or use as a weapon on Imperial worlds was up to debate, but it was obvious that the Mechanicus and the Eldar were both chasing it. It was impressive that whoever was carrying it was managing to stay ahead of both of them. The fact that they were evading pursuit probably explained the semi-random course across the border worlds, though. The question was what to do about it. There was no way we'd back off and let the Admech handle things. Imperial worlds getting wiped out like the one we'd just visited wasn't acceptable. The only options were to try and catch the carrier in a stern chase, try to predict their next destination, and set an ambush. Or go get some real reinforcements and try to lock down the entire subsector. Debates were had, charts were consulted, the captain was called down, and three possible destinations were laid out. The captain was in favor of getting reinforcements, and wanted us to chart a course to the largest imperial world along the border. Battleaxe and Sword Guy thought too much damage would be done before a response was mustered. She wanted us to try and jump ahead to a refueling way station that looked like it might be in the right direction. He wanted to head towards a nearby Imperial world with a rather untrusted governor that might either be a target or buyer. Sarge, who was barely awake enough to follow what was going on, wound up being the tiebreaker. When all three of the adepts had just shrugged, Sarge had fallen back on his noncom instincts. He'd stood straight, squared his shoulders, and stabbed his finger at the middle option on the chart. Sarge had loudly declared that it was the only real choice, then retreated up to the med bay before anyone realized he'd just randomly picked one. None of us saw any problem with this decision-making process. In the morning, or whatever you call it, when the ship's lights jump from 10% to max power, and the captain blares reveille over the comm system, Sarge got around to debriefing Amy. She told a fairly unpleasant tale of wandering around the ass end of the sector as the Majos did his thing. Amy and her team had been treated like mushrooms, that is to say, kept in the dark and fed horse shit. They'd never learned anything about their mission, aside from the fact that Archaeotech was involved, and had spent most of their time getting shot at by over a dozen groups ranging from gangers to planetary police forces. It wasn't some sort of giant conspiracy, though. The Majos just didn't give a shit. If there was something in the way, he'd throw bodies at it all day long if it meant getting through quicker. He wasn't too particular about where those bodies came from, either. If his team couldn't handle a problem, he'd improvise. Amy claimed she'd never look at servitors the same way again. The next to last straw for Amy had been an ambush by what she now recognized as Eldar. That had killed off the last of her teammates and forced a retreat onto a merchant vessel. The Majos had proceeded to intimidate and bully the merchants into taking him on a tour of the empty worlds. To no one but the Majos' surprise, that relationship had ended with the merchants ditching them at the first opportunity, hence the island. She'd been stuck there alone with him, well, him and the servitor-converted bodies of her teammates, for a month. The real kicker was the bastard had a sort of interstellar communicator the whole time. He'd used it to put in a call to the nearest Forge world, but had refused to contact anyone else after the merchant incident. So yeah, all that went a long way to explaining the hysterics and head-shooting incident. 
The end of the story, though, was Amy had no really new intel. Between obvious clues, well, obvious to our depths, and that incredibly unsubtle warning from the Cogboys, we knew just as much as she did. Speaking of that warning, it had been awfully convenient that the tech priests had decided to give it to us instead of just staying quiet. We all suspected that Jim and Hannah had had some hand in that matter, but neither of them were talking to us currently. As the least shot member of the squad, Nubby, and by extension Fumbles, had been sent to chat with two junior tech priests after they didn't visit us in the med bay. When Nubby returned, he claimed that every time he'd tracked one of them down, they'd gotten these really nervous expressions and ran for it. He'd given up after Jim had locked him and Fumbles in a section of maintenance corridor. Also, if old Bill came by asking why one of his techs had a massive headache, and why there were reports of warp ghosts on Deck 8, that had nothing to do with him or Fumbles getting tired of waiting for the doors to open again. The destination Sarge had chosen, which turned out to be the way station, was a solid week of warp travel away. After about the second day, everyone was tired of sitting around the med bay with Doc and his lady friend, so we moved back to our nice Gellerfield generator-adjacent quarters. Doc complained a little that our treatments, especially Amy's, weren't finished, but we figured that coming down and making a few house calls would be good for him. He'd been getting soft being in that chair all day. Some exercise would do him good. Sarge spent most of the next week putting together reports and contingency plans with the adepts and interrogators, but he spared some thought for Jim and Hannah. He'd interpreted the junior tech priest's behavior as a sign that their bosses were acting crazier than usual over this whole thing, and made a note to keep an eye on them. Intimidating, impressionable young tech priests was our shtick, since sending Nubby, Twitch, or Tink to watch them was likely to do more harm than good, some words were had with old Bill and the captain. The duty roster was shuffled, and several unintrusive armsmen and engineers were assigned to the same shifts as our cogbros. It might have been a bit of a paranoid over precaution, but that's sort of what being a guardsman in the Inquisition is all about. Nubby and his partner in petty crime wandered around the ship a lot during our transit. Anyone with enough brains to pour water out of a boot could tell they were planning to sabotage the betting pool in some way before their inevitable loss, but it wasn't worth doing anything about. As long as Nubby didn't egg fumbles into changing someone's mind for them again, it was about as harmless a pastime as they were likely to find. Amy, who was doing pretty well despite having bags of medical gel taped to half her face and one hand, had initially moved back into the quarters where her team had stayed. Unfortunately, those rooms brought back some unpleasant memories, and she was pretty sure the tech priests were following her. She said that every time she'd turned, there was a servo skull or servitor working nearby. Twitch sympathized with her and offered a solution. He proudly explained that our little base was 99% servitor free, and that other 1% would be gone when he found a ladder tall enough to reach the chunks that had stuck to the ceiling. She accepted, of course. How could anyone refuse an offer like that? About an hour after Amy moved in, her suspicions about the servitors were proving correct when the door claymore jibbed a cleaning servitor. Twitch immediately replaced the mine and got another kill within ten minutes, though that one might have just been there to clean up the first. Either way, they stopped coming after that, and Amy settled into Doc's section of room. She became as much of a shut-in as Twitch, splitting her time between sleeping off her medical treatment and playing with the toy Tink gave her. Tink and Twitch's lives over the week generally revolved around our new barracks mate. Tink, who seemed a little lonely now that Jim wasn't there to argue with him, had fixed Spot's chassis and replaced its servo grox skull disguise before the end of the second day. 
After that, he went back to work on the Xenos Pulse Rifle camouflage project and seized on Amy as a guinea pig. She was in the market for a new weapon after all, and it was so much easier to cram a pulse rifle into a long lasers chassis than a regular laser guns. They spent quite a while blowing holes in various objects and bad-mouthing tech priests. Twitch was just glad to have an actual reason to distrust the servitors, and turned the barracks defenses up from 11 to about 13. Sarge called for a slight de-escalation when he started putting in re small remote charges on every servitor he encountered, just in case they turned en masse. Apparently, Jim and Hannah were the ones who had to find and defuse them. On the seventh day, Sarge and the other interrogators put everyone on an hour alert and prepped the shuttles for immediate launch. The jury was still out on what we were likely to find when we came out of the warp, but if the target was docked at the way station, we wanted to neutralize it before it moved again. Also, before it attracted a bunch of angry Xenos, demons, or cogboys.